be co-presenting with Ron Partridge, Sidhi Sarahu Dubey, um, Nishank Varshne, and Kaylee Jo Schoenbeck. And the, the title of our presentation is um, Putting Communities in the Driver's Seat. Um, right. So um, I am representing CHIP today, and CHIP is the Community Health Improvement Partnership. This includes organizations throughout the Twin Cities um, that come together to address health issues. Um, and we attempt to have collective impact on these health issues. We partner with housing developers, providers, um, cultural and faith-based organizations, schools and health services as well. Um, the, what guides our work at CHIP are these four guiding principles. Um, we've, under, we've come to understand that racism is core at racial and economic disparities. And we try to dismantle systems that perpetuate these inequities. Um, we recognize the harm that, that our systems have caused and we shift and we, we try to shift towards organizations um, that, that make decisions to prevent harm. Um, we listen to community and we, we listen to community goals and we try to help them um, reach their goals in a way that isn't uh, overbearing and we act, we, we participate or we act um, collectively upstream, um, trying to harness power of the group rather than just higher up making decisions. The two priorities for CHIPS and for CHIP includes um, community mental well being and housing stability. Um, for the community mental well being, again, we, with the members of our collective, we work towards. Um, within, within our each um, respective organization, so it's becoming trauma informed, and then coming back as a collective and sharing these sharing successes and challenges, so we can all learn together as we all work to become trauma informed. And then for the housing stability team, here we're working towards reducing the housing barriers for prospective tenants and residents, um, but also supporting uh, creative uh, solutions to housing insecurity that is coming from the community. Um, and so the purpose of our presentation today is to talk about one of the initiatives that CHIP is undergoing, which is the mini grants. Um, as of now, we've funded two rounds of mini grants and we just finished up a third, we just finished up um, grading a third round and those, and those funds will be going out sometime in the next few weeks. And these grants are 300, 300 to $500 um, that we, uh, allocate, allocate to community members to work on a project that addresses community mental well-being or housing stability. Housing instability. Um, the proposals are all community-led, and we go through and we we choose projects that we think that are um, very well thought out, and we think that will make an impact on the communities that they're coming from. Um, we have these community members come in and present a chip. So as they're learning, we're also learning with them and implementing some of the um, new uh, approaches to addressing community mental well-being and housing stability that comes from their project. Um, and that, with that being said, I will hand it over to Ron, who will present on the project that he worked on for his mini grant. Um, Ron, you're muted. Okay, you can hear me now? Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to say a heartfelt thanks. This is, comes from the elders at Bindigindash on Webby and the St. Paul Home Apartments. Uh, they're the ones that benefited from this grant and they wanted to make sure that I thank people. I thank the CHIP people and the community team that uh, awarded us the grant. First of all, our proposal was to have a stay at home, stay safe bingo games going on during this pandemic. Pandemic, pandemic. But first, you no, know, uh, the people. When we asked for comments from uh, the participants, we got so, so many comments. We didn't just get one comment from each one. We got a lot of comments, and we get those every day or uh, having them something to do every day during the week. Sometimes even on weekends, we've done it when uh, we've uh, had the time and the money. But uh, 
St. Paul Homes Apartments was the one that benefited from this grant mostly because we were uh, able to include them into our stay at home, stay safe bingo games. This, um, these people uh, had to be dropped from our program because we ran out of money and we are just going uh, on bingo games for the uh, meeting in Dash, uh, elder housing right now until we can make, get more money. Uh, right now we're having a big uh, grad sale so we can come up with some more money to include St. Paul apartments again. But everyone's waiting for that and uh, Hopefully this uh, will help, it does help actually a lot for these elders' mental health and the feeling of being in a community, which they, I think just about everyone uh, can say that they lost. Uh, the community is probably one of the most important parts, being able to talk uh, with one another. The, that was the overall goal, was to make sure that our elders uh, had something to do during the day and to look forward to it. We, uh, we, we provided a lot of uh, prizes that were pretty much uh, very important to the elders. Things like uh, personal hygiene, and we provided quarter rolls for laundry services. Laundry soap, toilet paper, and uh, uh, hand wipes. All these things that were kind of hard to get at first. And sometimes uh, they still are kind of hard to get. But uh, we were able to provide them with a lot of this stuff that uh, people really needed. <clears throat> I, I think our overall goal was just to keep these people informed of what's going on in the community because I'm the one that takes these uh, uh, bingo numbers to each person each day and I have a conversation with them to find out when and if they're having problems. And they actually look forward to that knock on a door each day, uh, sometimes twice. I see a lot of these elders quite a bit since I work here. It is uh, probably the best thing at the moment that we can provide for them. As time goes by here, we'll be able to take some of these uh, elders out who are able to travel and get them out of their apartments. But right now, everything is still shut down. We are still being safe. And uh, there's only a very strong feeling right now, especially with, with uh, the things going on in our community of our members feeling not safe at all in their apartments because there's a lot of crime in this area. Our buildings, both of our buildings have been broken into at least 10 times over the past two years. So we've lost a lot of stuff, including TVs and things that the elders use. They took a lot of our supplies and uh, things like that. You know, they, they just took everything that the elders really needed. So we're doing our fundraisers right now to help uh, replace some of this stuff. And which is kind of a, kind of a, a hard thing to do right now, but and and one other thing I forgot to mention too is that we've been applying for grants to replace some of this money we need to keep these uh, bingo games going, not only here at Be the Game, but also at St. Paul's Home Apartments. Uh, these people have been asking me over there uh, when are we going to start bingo there again since we had to stop because we ran out of money, but. That uh, grant we got last year really brought out uh, really some good feelings from these elders over at St. Paul's Home Apartments because they're allowed, you know, they, we allowed them to play bingo with us here at Beatty Game. And now, since they're not playing bingo anymore, 
where they are starting to do their own fundraisers and getting big winning at their own buildings. So that was something that we were at least able to show them how to do. And that grant we got last year started that whole process out with them. So we were able to show them how to do it. And hopefully they'll be able to find some way to get their own bingo games going. We do have bingo games still going here at the uh, BD game. Uh, it goes on during the week, five days a week. But uh, it's the uh, prizes that uh, provide probably is one of the biggest problems we have right now uh, is uh, providing all these bingo prizes. Some of them are, uh, I suppose, uh, some of them, some of the elders that said, yeah, they're kind of cheap. So we're trying to upgrade our prizes just to make them more uh, uh, interesting. And that is what we are trying to do now with, we're applying for other grants also. So this is basically uh, our program and we hope to certainly keep this going. Thanks. Thank you, Ron. Um, there's a few questions in the chat, but I think we can sure. come back to those at the end. Okay. Um, so now I'll have uh, Sid He and Li Shank uh, present. And let me know when you guys want me to transition the slides as well. Yeah. Okay. So hello, everyone. I'm Nishank. And Siddhi, do you want to introduce? Hi, all. Uh, I'm Siddhi. I work with Nishank on this particular project. And Nishank will be presenting for us today. And I'll be around for any questions. Go ahead, Nishank. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, uh, so I'll be presenting our work at the Chateau Housing Cooperative. Uh, so this is a housing cooperative in the Dinky Town area of Minneapolis. And uh, so uh, the Chateau Cooperative, it's a 127 house apartment, which houses around 300 students. Uh, and these students belong to diverse racial backgrounds, including international students. A majority of the students are international students. And with social instability, isolation, and cut off from families and supports. Uh, there was loss of employment. So many students were experiencing unusually high stress uh, during the last summer. So uh, we as a community were determined to help each other ease this burden, supporting mental health through avenues to unwind and de-stress them. And this is one such initiative that uh, some of us thought could help uh, the student community here. So uh, could you go to the next slide? So the proposal uh, we pitched to uh, the CHIP was to provide art kits to the residents uh, based on an interest survey that we floated. So we gave options to have crayons or paints with brush, uh, palette, and canvas. So providing uh, the complete kit or for uh, people who are already into painting, if they have all these things, then just high quality colors. So we gave them three options to sign up. And uh, finally, we, uh, we thought of hosting a Zoom session for people to kind of come together and share their art and experience of how they felt through this process. So the intended recipients were the uh, residents, I've already talked about that. And our goal was to provide an opportunity of creative escape. So, so people can, can use this time and also meet other community members virtually while being safe. Next slide, please. So uh, after we got this funding, our major challenge was that we got more signups than our funding could support. So we had, uh, to give you an idea, our cooperative has uh, a board of directors. So it's 16 members and both Siddhi and I are also part of the board of directors. So we have we organized virtual events in the past and none of the events got more than 10 or 20 people. So we were, we were confident that we'll be able to give kits to like 20, 30 people based on the funding that we get. 
uh, but we had 52 signups and that was a record for us. So, uh, so we kind of went to the board of directors and put a, put this proposal there again and saying that, you know, we have this funding from the Hennepin County. Uh, would you give the supplementary funds to kind of get kit for everybody so that, you know, we don't, uh, people don't miss out or we don't have to compromise on the quality of the kits. Uh, so thankfully that proposal passed and we got uh, supplementary funding from uh, the board. So uh, our learning from this event was that uh, small initiatives like these open new pathways for community engagement, because after this event was done, residents shared pictures of their art and expressed how this activity helped them to relax and de-stress. So we have our community's Facebook group and uh, we asked people to post their pictures and we also shared them on Instagram. So if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see the outcome. So people shared uh, the work uh, and this is picture from their apartment. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, please. So the one that you see on left is a traditional art from India. Uh, in Maharashtra, a state. And uh, so residents were happy that they were able to uh, learn something new at the same time, uh, something that they had uh, imagined of and they could like bring it on canvas. So that was really uh, good. The feedback that we heard was helpful. And if you go on to the next slide, this is uh, the preview. Yeah. So this is one of the posts from our Facebook group, uh, one of the student recreated a, photogra a photograph that her friend had taken in Virginia. And she says that never realized colors could be so much fun. And uh, so, so, so this kind of like, it also got other residents to, to see what uh, we're doing as a community. And uh, it kind of wrote, hold the ball for future events. So if you go to the next slide, uh, we got some recommendations. We got ideas that we could extend this uh, from painting to baking. So provide baking kits and uh, uh, maybe host a Zoom session for people to teach, other, teach each other how to bake or share their recipes or even like show off their culinary skills. Uh, some others expressed an interest in initiating a book club. And then uh, we got some books from the coordinator at the Hennepin County. She herself was, uh, uh, she dropped off books for our community. And, and we have now a book, a little free library at our community. So, uh, so our recommendation from this project is that we, uh, we feel that these micro grants can empower the community members to kind of take an opportunity to lead. And the community members are, are closely suited to kind of understand what are the particular needs. Uh, as we saw in the previous presentation by Ron as well, that, you know, uh, we are closer living with the community. So, so we know that you know, what are the avenues, what things have been done and what things can be done next. So, so that kind of puts us in a, in a good position to uh, take the lead. And also about uh, the opportunity for safe social interaction and avenues for virtual participation, because uh, I still feel that the pandemic is not yet over. And, and even, if, even after this, there are still opportunities for us to engage uh, in virtual settings going forward. So, so that was our learnings and we would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, thank you, Nishank. Um, and then next is uh, Kaylee Schoenbeck. <clears throat> And so these are the photos of the project that I did, which was self-care packages for people that live at Dow Towers. Um, the middle picture there is kind of all of the items I was able to purchase. And then the two on the sides are two kind of examples of the things that were in the packages. If you could go to the next slide. 
So my proposal, like I said, was to do these self-care packages for people at Dow Towers. Um, Dow Towers is a 76 unit independent living apartment building for low income people. And it primarily houses older adults and people with disabilities. Um, and 88% of the people in the 76 units right now fall into one or sometimes both of those categories. Um, with the goal of this, um, I actually received an email from the property manager there asking if I had any ideas for ways to utilize a grant like this. Um, so we came up with a few ideas, probably like 15. Um, and this was the one we settled on as something that would be able to be utilized well within the building and could use those funds to go kind of a long way um, with the goal of helping people lower their overall stress level and kind of reduce the risk of using some maladaptive coping mechanisms, um, trying to decrease some increased mental health symptoms or psychiatric decompensation or hospitalizations. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a picture of one of the residents that got the self-care bag. His name is Jim and he was very excited to be part of this presentation. Um, Jim is a very good representation of somebody who lives in this building, um, an older adult, he's a veteran and um, obviously living on a small budget. Um, and those are some of the quotes that some of the people gave when they got their self-care packages. Um, the challenges I found was largely just around trying to figure out what to get, how to get enough to do one for everybody with the money that we had, um, and then putting them together and distributing it to everybody in the building. Um, one of the things that made that very time consuming is people really did want to talk. They were so grateful and so excited about it that every person that I brought a bag to, they, it was a five, 10 minute conversation. So you can imagine going to 76 different apartments, it, it took quite a while, um, but it was very moving to be able to be the one to, to give these to these people. Um, the successes were how wonderful it was received. Um, a lot of people really kind of just said that it was nice to be thought of um, and that they often felt that they were kind of forgotten about. Um, so I learned that there was a lot of gratitude. Um, there was a lot of joy in giving and receiving. One of the residents told me that, <laughs> that he was giving some of the things in the bag away um, and how much joy that brought him to do that. Um, also, like other people had said, learned that there was a great need for connection and support, especially during the pandemic. Um, a, a lot of difficulty with technology, I realized, um, with people being older adults and low income, not having access to some of that to be able to connect with people during the pandemic was huge, especially within this building. Um, and the other thing I included in the bag was a scale to write the kind of measure where their stress was before they used something in the bag and then after, and I asked them to turn that into um, kind of see how well these did and I got about 30 of them back and the average was that it went from being a nine out of 10 for stress down to a five out of 10. So for me, that was a huge success. Uh, next slide, please. And then for recommendations and follow-up, um, <laughs> I, I honestly can't say enough about the kind of ripple effects that this has had um, from just getting a random email about a small mini grant. Um, I was able to, when I presented to the CHIP committee about it, somebody in that group shared a resource with me to get laptops for people. Um, so through that avenue, then I was able to apply and got 15 brand new laptops for some of the residents. Um, and that, I mean, was even greater than the self-care packages. Um, for some of them, it was the first computer they'd ever had. Some of them cried when we were talking about it. I spent a lot of time trying to teach computers and, and technology to people. So that's some recommendations I had that there's just a, a huge lack of access to technology, a lack of education around the use of technology. And because of that, there's a need for new avenues of connection. Um, also just this, overall idea that oftentimes public housing, housing buildings are overlooked for funding. Um, and it's a shame because like I said, a lot of the people in the building are older adults and people with disabilities and um, trying to get them connected to a lot of 
really cool things is hard. Um, but it was nice to be able to do that. And they continue to talk about the self-care packages and how great the computers are. Um, so I am just, I, I can't say enough great things about this program. So that was my, my project. Awesome. Thank you, Kaylee. And I guess now we open up to questions. Um, yeah, I've kept track of the ones from the chat and I'll just do them in the order I received them, if that sounds all right. Um, the first question, or there's a couple questions about how people could contribute to supporting all of these efforts. Um, questions came with the first presentation, but is there a link to fundraisers or ways that people can support these efforts? I think the, this is Ron Partridge again. Uh, I think the, the the grant that we have applied for just recently is going to hopefully take away some of these problems that we're getting uh, bigger prizes and presents uh, to our elders. Uh, so we do have a few different uh, funding sources coming up. Ever since we started this process, we've been getting more and more. So we will be finally be able to uh, start bingo with other communities, especially the place where I live at, at St. Paul's Home Apartments. So they're pretty much overjoyed with that part. And but the funding is finally starting to pick up a little bit. And that's my experience. Do any of the other presenters have ways that they would appreciate people to uh, contribute to their work? I also have one more uh, question, maybe a suggestion is to, in this, our little group we have going to, is to share funding resources. Uh, something, something, sometimes uh, we don't know about uh, grants that are become available. And we certainly uh, welcome ch the CHIP community also to keep us informed of any grants coming in. Mm -hmm. And I know I said I was going to go in order, but that leads to a question that was in the chat. So I am going to move around, I guess. Um, okay. There are some questions about what type of outreach CHIP does with communities in order to spread awareness and access to micro grants. So maybe, Chi, I don't know if you want to talk about that. Yeah, so I was a part of the most recent round of mini grants that were sent out. And basically how it worked was that we sent, so we posted the grants opportunity on the CHIP website. Um, we sent it out to the um, CHIP executive committee, which are made up of um, different organizations throughout the Twin Cities. And we asked them to share with their network um, we sent it out to our two action teams. Um, that's the Community Mental Wellbeing Action Team and the Housing Stability Action Team. And we asked them to also send it out to their network as well. Uh, so that's kind of the extent to which CHIP made um, the mini grant opportunity known to the community with the hopes that the members of these action teams and the executive will then send these opportunities out to their network and hopefully that will also lead to them they, those individuals send out to their network um so that I, I think there's definitely um other there may be other opportunities to potentially use social media as a potential platform to let these um opportunities be known but i'm not exactly sure how um social media savvy chip is but I do know that Nishank, you all, you all saw the um, mini grant opportunity on a Facebook page. So I wonder if you could share a little bit about how that happened. So 
So I'm part of a Facebook group called Locus, which is a group of people of color who are looking for opportunity. So somebody shared it there and then I shared it with uh, some of the members of our board of directors at our community and people I know who wanted to, to do something uh, that earlier was not uh, getting passed through the board of directors. So, so, uh, so uh, I guess I can also take on the next question about uh, the application process a little bit uh, because I think that ties to this. Uh, so uh, that was also kind of what got us to apply. The application process was fairly simple. It was a two page uh, PDF application and really limited words for us to write. So, uh, so it wasn't a burdening process and only as much information was required as would be good uh, or actually required by them and not any superfluous information. Uh, so uh, Siddhi, do you have anything to add about the application process? Right, the application process was fairly simple and they also included a wind up. So post event, there was one um, report sort of a thing and that was also fairly easy to complete. So um, I mean, application st standpoint, there was, it wasn't a deterrent. So it was very, very easy process. Um, yeah, the little bit challenge that we had was um, securing the funding once we got allocated the funding because um, as Nishank mentioned, both of us are um, international students and many, many international students have the restriction that they cannot receive funding from external agencies apart from their schools. So there was that little bit of a glitch but somehow we could approach our friends and got them to receive funding on our behalf. And then we could reroute those funds to the community. So that all worked out pretty smoothly as well. I have a question. This is Ron again. I, uh, are those uh, grants still available? For instance, if someone from St. Paul's Home Apartments applied for that? So the mini grant opportunity, um, at least the, for round three is closed now, um, but there is another opportunity that's coming out soon for uh, individuals who received mini grants in the past. And these are gonna be grants to help them like continue to build off of what they did for their first mini grant. So there is another opportunity coming up but as for the round three one, those, that opportunity has closed. Do you have any idea when that would be coming available? Yeah, uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll start sending out those emails. I see, okay. Yeah. There were a couple of questions about the extent to which um, programming was in person or virtual. So there's a question about if bingo was in person or virtual, and then whether all groups think there'll be more in-person work once, once COVID subsides. Um, I'll be I'll be happy to connect and keep this um, good cycle going. So if uh, Chi can connect all of us together, or if we can just meet sometime over Zoom, and then once the pandemic subsides, it will be all fine. Hopefully soon. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. And I think within the community, like I mentioned, ours is a housing cooperative, so we. We used to have in-person events and I hope we will continue to have them, uh, things like food truck event or even celebrating uh, cultural events like Lunar New Year, Diwali and other festivals. So uh, in the past two years, uh, we have hosted many events in person. So, uh, so depending on the community, yes. But I think this, what this opportunity what this project has provided is an opportunity for at least people to know each other, even in a virtual setting. And hopefully that will definitely translate into in-person meetings once the pandemic is over. Was the bingo in person, Ron? It, you know, the first bingo game we started was in person and everything after that was uh, in their own apartments. That's when the pandemic started and everything was locked down. 
but ever since then we've been doing it and it's been pretty successful and the elders really look forward to that each day you know just to catch up on the latest news for me mostly because i'm the one that delivers the numbers to them each day it sounds like you all very quickly mastered the art of trying like really authentically connecting people virtually which is something i feel like i still challenge with so i want to congratulate you on that it sounds like that was really quickly of important connection for people yes uh that's one, one other thing i heard too is that we also got some computers recently and i'm in the process of helping them uh, set that up zoom meetings and whatever youtube or whatever they want to watch you know some of these people have never had a computer before like it was said before and don't know a thing about it so it's kind of uh kind of fun uh teaching them to uh at least to get on some of these things. There's a question about if mini grants and this kind of whole solution is applicable to other sectors. So like transportation or just other sectors in general. A good question. Um... I I don't see why not. I think the the goal of the mini grant was to is to create um, grassroots solutions to some of these larger issues. And I could see in a situation where a smaller grant may lead to um, a community finding ways to increase transportation for their residents or for members of the community. If that's putting multiple mini grants together to get a community vehicle or um, using the mini grants to subsidize uh, Uber, Uber passes or, or uh, Lyft passes or something along those lines. So I definitely think that the mini grant, the, the, the sole purpose of the mini grant could be applicable in other sectors. It just may take some creativity and um, amplifying the voice of the community members in those sectors. Mm -hmm. And right now, the two funding areas for the mini grants are housing and mental well-being, correct? Correct, yeah. Are, is CHIP thinking about adding or expanding those categories? That's, that's an, um, I think because the two priorities for CHIP, at least for this um, CHIP 2.0 is the community mental well-being and um, housing stability. The, the mini grants will tend to focus on those two um, areas. But I think that if CHIP 3.0 is a thing, that conversation will happen and then there'll be new priorities. And then if mini grants are available, those mini grants will address those priorities. So as of now, it is specifically for community mental well-being and housing stability. We have one minute left. I wanna thank you all and then also offer if any of the panelists have any final comments you wanna share, we've got a little time. <laughs> uh, I have one thing. So I discussed with Nishank and we have had other initiatives as well um, during this pandemic period to support our community. And we were thinking whether we can publish our experiences like a paper, some scientific communication. The only thing is both of us aren't very um, well conversant with the public health fields. So if somebody attending today is um, aware of what we can do, what avenues we can pursue, um, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my email address in the chat box. Thank you.